do some praying for God to help us understand, then we can understand God's word. Now, I would also say, and I'm going to point this out a little bit later, that one of the best ways to understand a difficult passage of scripture is to look at the total context. I gave you some examples last night. And to look at other passages of scripture on the same subject. And then it will become clear to you. Number four, the Bible is adapted to the human mind. The Bible is adapted to the human mind. God said in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and verse 9, My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high is, is, as the heaven is above the earth, that's how high my thoughts are above your thoughts. Now, if you just stop there, it might seem impossible for us to understand the things of God. But Isaiah 55, verse 10 through 11 goes on to say, but I've sent my word out, and my word will not return unto me void. Just as rain and snow fall from the heavens and water the earth, and the earth brings forth fruit, so my word goes forth, and it will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. So even though God's thoughts are much higher than ours, and we can never hope to understand all of the mind of God, God has given us his word so that we can understand important things about God. But what I'm trying to emphasize right now is the Bible is truth, but the Bible does not exhaust the truth. There's much more that we cannot comprehend because our minds are so small and God's mind, mind is so big. So God has to communicate to us in terms that we can understand. But that does not mean the truth is limited just to what we can understand. The truth is greater than what we can understand. I used some illustrations the other night when the Bible says, heaven is, God said uh, in the Bible, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Well, we understand it's not to mock God as a giant human being sitting there with his feet propped up on, on the North Pole. It's trying to describe the... Um, Om, omnipresence of God. He's everywhere present. The power of God, the omnipotence of God. He's all powerful. How can we describe God being everywhere? That's too big for our minds to understand. How can we describe God as being all powerful? That's too big for our minds to understand. So God has to use some terminology that we can relate to. But don't limit God to that terminology. God is bigger than that. When the Bible speaks of God as being a jealous God, don't think of jealousy in our sense where it would be associated with, um, with maybe sinful attitudes, but think of a holy jealousy. It's trying to describe the thoughts of God in terms that we can understand, but don't limit the infinite God just to the terms that we can understand. Here's another example. The Bible talks about sunrise and sunset. But now, we know the sun doesn't literally go up and down in the sky. But instead, the earth is rotating around. So would we say the Bible is lying? The Bible doesn't know proper science? The, no. The Bible is using terms of our experience. And we do that today. In our ordinary speech, we'll say, I saw the, the sun rise today. If somebody can say, oh, you're a liar. Don't you know physics? Don't you know uh, geology, don't you know astronomy? You mean you, don't, you think the sun goes up and down in the atmosphere of the earth? How ridiculous are you? No, that's just, we're, we're just using everyday speech to describe the way it appears. We know the reality of science is different than the way it appears. But we're simply using a convenient form of speech to communicate. Well, the Bible does the same. But don't limit the Bible's speech just to our understanding. Maybe I can give you another example. What's heaven like? Does anybody know what heaven is really like? How can we describe what heaven is going to be like? Now, there are some descriptions of the New Jerusalem. It talks about the streets are of pure gold, as transparent as glass. Well, what's the significance of that? I've thought about that. The Bible says in heaven the streets are of gold. 
But do we really care about the streets of heaven? I don't really care about the streets of heaven. Do you? But here's the, here's the significance. You know, the streets are the lowest form of existence. If somebody's sleeping on the streets, that's a pretty sad life. Somebody's living on the streets, that's pretty bad. On the streets, you find dirt. And on the streets, uh, you find common materials. Um, rocks and concrete and asphalt. That's ordinary, everyday, common, dirty materials. But in heaven, the streets are of gold. Uh, what I think that is trying to tell us, the insignificant things about heaven are greater than the greatest things we have here. So just to describe the least of heaven, we have to use uh, the most valuable things in our vocabulary. So what's the good part of heaven? What's the wonderful part of heaven? We can't even describe it. Because just to describe the streets, we have exhausted our human thinking and our human vocabulary. So what I'm saying is, heaven is greater than the description in the Bible. Don't limit heaven by that description. You know, people say, oh, I, I want to see the streets of gold. Oh, I want to see the gates of pearl. Oh, well, yes, but after a few million years, it, that won't be important to you. You know, just to limit heaven by that description is making it much smaller than it really is. Heaven is much greater than that. You see? So the Bible has been written in terms that we can comprehend. So when the Bible says that the streets are of gold, we say, wow, it really must be great. And that's what the Bible is saying. But that's not all there is to heaven. There's a lot more to heaven than that. But the Bible can't really describe it to us. Because our minds are not big enough to understand it. Okay, number five. God reveals truth progressively from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When human beings fell into sin, we destroyed God's plan. And so God has, ever since that time, has been trying to lead us back into a full understanding of his purpose, step by step. He couldn't do it all at once. He had to train us, the human race. And uh, we see some examples of this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 through 25. The law was a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to Christ. But after we've come to Christ, we no longer need that, that schoolmaster. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 through 17 says that let no one judge you in things such as uh, food or drink or Sabbath days and so on because that is the shadow, the foreshadowing, but the reality is in Christ. These things were types and shadows that pointed to greater truth. It's, it's like if you're standing at a building and somebody's coming around the corner and before they get there, you see their shadow cast. And so you can tell somebody's getting, coming around the corner. And maybe you look at the shadow and where the sun is and you can see, is it a tall person or a short person or a skinny person or a fat person? But you can't really tell what they look like. You cannot tell who they are. You only get a vague understanding, a general idea. But when the person comes around the corner, you can see their face and you can know who they are. So you don't keep looking at the shadow. Now, who is that? Who is that? You look at the person right there. Okay? So in the Old Testament, we see the animal sacrifices. They teach us a lot of things. They teach us that, that all of us have sinned, that sin uh, requires a penalty, that the wages of sin is death. We need a sacrifice for our sins. We need a Savior. We need to have faith in God's plan and obey his plan. So those sacrifices were pointing to Calvary. They were pointing to Christ. But they didn't actually tell us who Christ was. They were getting us ready, preparing us. Well, now that Christ has come and we know about his death, burial, and resurrection, there's no need to keep practicing the animal sacrifices. That would be like looking at the shadow when the person is already there. So we need to forget about the shadows and look to Jesus. So the Old Testament had a purpose to bring us to Christ, and it still has a purpose of teaching us, but we find greater truth in the New Testament. So 
on, on various subjects of Christianity.